What if WWE decided to engineer an entire pay-per-view for the sole benefit of a wrestler that much of the audience was actively rejecting? Well, then you'd have WrestleMania 32, of course, which is already available in this series, its archives. Yes, WrestleMania 32 was the night in which WWE calculated that putting a slew of heels over in mostly bad and uninspired matches, plus having Roman Reigns slay aging Triple H for the WWE title in a slow final act, would equal Roman Reigns becomes idolized on the level of 1985 Hulk Hogan. Sadly for WWE, the numbers did lie and their sacrifice proved disastrous. Speaking of WrestleMania 32, for today's entry into the pantheon of regrettable wrestling shows, we look back at the origin story of Everybody Hates Roman, a sort of proto-WrestleMania 32. Because long before Reigns became head of the table, WWE was struggling to shoehorn his chair into the table in everyone's hearts. And it wasn't exactly subtle either. The 2015 WWE Royal Rumble is one of the worst shows ever. On January 26, 2014, in front of Dr. Britt Baker DMD and about 16,000 other spectators at the Royal Rumble in Pittsburgh, an unprecedented sequence of events was set into motion. It began when somebody in power, perhaps a suspiciously muscular old man with rage issues, though not necessarily Vince, decided to book one of the Guardians of the Galaxy to win the 30-man Rumble match. Now, this would have been fine if it were Groot, who at least has a catchphrase and can run the ropes better than Tyrus, but instead WWE opted to put over Drax, played by Dave Batista, who hadn't been seen in WWE in about four years and had just turned up one day dressed like Pitbull. See, WWE had designs on running Batista vs Randy Orton at WrestleMania 30 to determine who was the worst wrestler of 2005. Unfortunately though, this was 2014, more than five Saw movies later, and besides, Fans already had a new desired protagonist in Daniel Bryan, the leader of the still unofficial Yes Movement. Long story short, the fans in Pittsburgh and beyond were outraged when WWE omitted Bryan from the Rumble match completely. They openly rejected Batista and showered the Rumble's final sequence with sustained anger. If this Rumble match were a tweet, then it'd definitely be ratioed into oblivion. After weeks of continued audience anger, WWE's brain trust made the decision not to run a WrestleMania main event with a projected winner that would get booed as though they were 2006 John Cena trying to sell NFTs of crappy stick figures. Some creative maneuvering led to Bryan being ultimately figured into the world title match where he defeated Orton and Batista to become a champion at night's end. A feel good moment, but more importantly, a very wise booking decision. However, it came with a price. WWE had, in essence, told its audience that if they don't like the participants in a WrestleMania main event, if they just complain long enough and loudly enough, they might be able to get that main event changed. Because now, now there was a precedent. But what are the odds that WWE would repeat their mistake by pushing another unwanted babyface into the WrestleMania title picture? After learning a valuable lesson on the road to WrestleMania 30, wouldn't WWE be more likely to check the temperature of the room going forward? And that brings us on to singles babyface Roman Reigns. What a time. I mean, it's not hard to understand why Roman got the rubber stamp from Uncle Vince. He's got a superstar look, he's an impressive build, and is highly athletic for a heavyweight and has proven to be a total liability on the mic when he isn't given inane things to say, that is. That's four good things right there. The problem was the loudest parts of the audience had decided that they didn't want to be dictated to. For nearly the previous decade, the audience fought WWE on Super Cena, on not pushing CM Punk enough, on brushing Daniel Bryan and Zack Ryder aside, and on sticking part-timers in plump positions at the expense of the general workforce. Mind you, the audience paid premium prices for pay-per-views and tickets while registering this opposition to WWE's booking, without ever once realizing the irony, so the revolution was obviously not well thought out. You know, really sticking it to the man by dropping a couple grand on floor level seats just so that you can chant Cena sucks all night. Now, what else was Vince gonna say besides thanks? But getting back on track, by the autumn of 2014, many fans had decided they just weren't feeling Roman as the top good guy. And this was kinda odd because The Shield were incredibly over from pretty much the jump and fans wholly accepted Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins as prospective tippy top guys. Hell, there wasn't really any backlash against Roman until he went solo after the group disintegrated and then suddenly everyone just decided, yeah, screw this guy in his flak jacket. It was so weird watching, say, Roman get booed out of the building at SummerSlam against Randy Orton because the big dog hadn't really done anything to inflame hatred among the crowd. 
Then came the promos. Like the one where he vowed to use his Superman punch to make it rain in this bitch, or the Jack and the Beanstalk homage, or yes, suffering succotash, which in terms of credibility destroying might not quite surpass slapping Chris Rock after cameras initially catch you laughing at his joke. But it's definitely a few streets over. If Roman Reigns were to sue WWE credited for career malpractice, it'd be hard to blame him. At the time, however, this was the likely Rumble winner, and with that knowledge, tension knotted in the guts of many dedicated viewers. Could WWE actually put over the wrong guy two years in a row? But wait, Daniel Bryan, fresh from his many months away, has also declared for the Rumble. Well, now the company has a decision to make. Nah, I can't even keep up with a bit. Yeah, Roman's winning. Drax once said it. Deal with it. It's a field light on sensible choices for winner, as the only other viable picks are heavily pushed Bray Wyatt, extremely popular Dean Ambrose, momentum riding US champion Rusev, and the Survivor Series hero Dolph Ziggler, who really only enjoyed that big moment as a fill-in because Roman was injured. As for the rest of the field, everybody else pretty much has scoliosis from the absurdly low ceilings placed over them. So we're talking more fodder and filler than the Oscars red carpet show. Speaking of the Oscars, the WWE title triple threat match has some A-listers in the mix, as John Cena and Seth Rollins vie to unseat Brock Lesnar, who's wrestling his first match in four months. And he's the champion. Seriously, it was nice of Brock to show up between deer hunting and bear hunting seasons to collect another six-figure paycheck. And you know what's weird? Everyone hated Brock Lesnar because he took eight months off at the time, holding the belt hostage. Everybody hated Roman Reigns because of some misguided principle. But then Roman got really popular after he started taking eight months off at a time and also holding the belt hostage. Wrestling's quite weird. Beneath the two big bouts are three tag team soirees, one of which was for the tag team titles. Champions Jay and Jimmy Uso, the pre us pre heat pre-day one to be down since, took on the forgotten duo of The Miz and his stunt double, Damien Mizdow. Ah, Damien Sandow. It's a classic story, really. Guy shows promise. Guy stumbles on a character that gets him insanely over with the audience. Comedy teases big push for the guy when he falls out with his villainous teammate. Guy loses to villainous teammate in forgettable TV match. Guy goes adrift with worthless comedy gimmick. Company releases Guy. Fans complain that Guy was buried. Guy goes to different companies, but fans don't follow him because they have strict watching habits. Fans forget about the Guy. Company makes metric tons of profit anyways. Shakespearean, really. Total Divas was considerably less Shakespearean, but the reality series had its own pay-per-view tie-in, pitting the Bella Twins against Natalia and Paige. The impetus for the match was a series of sub-three-minute TV bouts where the participants one-upped each other, you know, a staple of good story development in the late-stage Divas era. Thank God Stephanie came along later this year to invent women's wrestling, right? The other match is a true oddity, as it pits the Ascension against the New Age Outlaws, who at this point are as New Age as Hammerpants. Here is the progression of the events that led to this match. The Ascension dominate NXT for a long time and get called up to WWE's main roster. The Ascension receive slight character tweak, becoming something more akin to the Road Warriors or Demolition Wannabes. Road Warrior and Demolition Wannabes with badass names like Connor and Victor, which I guess is like if Axe and Smash were named Brad and Earl. After a shaky start, the Ascension gets their legs cut out from under them as commentator JBL buries them at every turn, with Vince no doubt shouting in his ear. And the two then get beaten up by legends on Raw. Two of those legends are Daddy Ass and the Roadie, leading to this grudge match. Fortunately, the Ascension's mishandling was an anomaly, and from then on, every single NXT call up was treated with dignity and care on the main roster. And that, my friends, is what WWE booked for the 2015 Royal Rumble. I don't know if you can tell, but there was no competition stateside at the time. Hell, the remnants of Dixie's TNA was actually struggling to pay the electric bill in 2015. Nonetheless, over 17,000 fans filed into Philadelphia's Well Fargo Center for the Royal Rumble, culminating a two-year pact between WWE and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to piss off every possible resident with tone-deaf rumble booking. In a solid pre-show match, Cesaro and Tyson Kidd defeated a pre-heel turn, pre-groove discovering not yet over New Day. All four men are going to be in the rumble match later on, which is crazy because if the 2014 Rumble taught us anything, it's that wrestling a match earlier in the night disqualifies you from working the Rumble. The actual pay-per-view begins with the Outlaws and the Ascension, a five-minute encounter in which the face-painted monsters of latter day decimate their aging counterparts to firmly establish that they are the team to beat. 
Nah, just kidding. The Outlaws got in all of their signature spots, while Billy Gunn dwarfed the 2K call version of Animal and Hawk. The Ascension ended up winning anyway, but neither man looked particularly strong against two opponents with a combined age of 96. To summarise, the Ascension slaughtered pretty much everybody they encountered in WWE's farm system, but were very nearly done in by 45 year old Rod Dog's shaky knee drop thing. The next tag bout was the one for the titles, pitting red hot Damien Mizdow and partner Miz against the Usos, and it's certainly more action packed. The crowd eats up Mizdow's shtick with a spoon and the quality of the wrestling is solid, and we get some teases of dissension between the Hollywood duo. Maybe the match was a little short at a brisk 9 minutes, but nothing to really complain about. The Usos retain, and it is what it is. That's followed by the Total Divas tag bout, clocking in at 8 minutes, with much of it building to the hot tag as Natalia took the heat. A little bit of quiz time. What did Paige do after receiving the hot tag? Did she A. Clean house of both Bella Twins, pinning Nikki to set up a future Divas title match. B. Hold her own with both Bellas, but fall victim to some villainous chicanery at the end. C. Grab the mic and ask the Bellas why the hell they're on good terms, seeing as Nikki told Brie she wished she died in the womb just four months ago. D. Not actually tag in to the match, as Natalia was pinned with a forearm smash before a hot tag could even be rendered. If you guess D, you've clearly been unremittingly haunted by this show for many years, because that's exactly what happened. And if you guess C, come on, the Bellas reuniting after that remark isn't that big of a deal. Hell, Adam tells me once a week he wishes I died in the womb, but we still hit up Nando's together. And sometimes he tells me it during the meal and still makes me pay. Love that guy. Speaking of delicious, there's nothing bad to say about the WWE title match between Lesnar, Cena and Rollins. Objectively, it was probably WWE's best main roster match of 2015 and proved that still ascending Rollins belonged in the ring with two of WWE's promotional titans, especially after he busted out that Phoenix splash. This was just great. How about we take a look at Dave Meltzer's ratings for the first four pay-per-view bouts, just to get a little bit of a gauge here. The Ascensions vs The Outlaws got 1.25, The Usos vs The Mizzies equals 3, Bellas vs Natty and Paige get 1, and Brock, Cena, Seth 4.75. And it's a one match show, but what a match. I mean, I could go on longer about that match if need be, but I won't, because I need to save my energy for the Rumble itself, because it's gonna need a lot of dissection. But first, a little, um, Royal Rumble by the numbers. $773 million. That's what Guardians of the Galaxy brought in at the box office, so you won't find Batista here. He's too busy walking for miles inside of Pit of Dollars. 17,164. That's the number of fans at the Wells Fargo Center that will begin booing themselves hoarse in... about half an hour? One, the number of WrestleManias that were shining successes on the merit of putting Daniel Bryan in the main event. Are you listening, Vince? 426. The number of times Ross would have screamed kill at our television during the Rumble match if Cultaholic existed at the time. Kill! Kill! <laughs> yes! 5. The number of hours that it takes to fly from LA to Philadelphia in case a certain A-list movie star wants to magically be on hand to do a run-in at the end of a wrestling match to defend his bleeding pseudo-relative. We're not sure who this could be, since as far as we know Colin Farrell doesn't have any cousins that wrestle. 59 minutes and 33 seconds, the bell to bell duration of what I'm about to describe. As the great philosopher Steve Martin said in The Jerk, roll the ugliness. So we begin with The Miz and R-Truth renewing their post awesome truth hostilities and then Bubba Ray Dudley shows up. The ECW original clears out both men before Luke Harper enters at four. Bully Ray versus Mr. Brody Lee would have been lots of fun, but this will have to do. Bray Wyatt's fifth and the family reunion ends Bubba's random comeback. Curtis Axel's supposed to be at six, but Eric Rowan usurps his number and or soul to give us the proper Wyatt trinity. But only momentarily, as Wyatt bounds both men out after an all too brief encounter that could have certainly gone on much longer. Wyatt then decimates the next three entrants, Boogeyman, Sin Cara and Zack Ryder in next to no time at all. And it's all pretty low energy at this point. Number 10 though, is Daniel Bryan, prompting the following reaction from the crowd. Yeah! Oh, he's not winning, is he? Nonetheless, Bryan and Wyatt have a lively sequence that gets intruded upon by mid-carders Fandango, Tyson Kidd and Stardust. DDP hits the ring at 14 to lead the audience through the requisite breathing exercises they're going to need to get through the rest of the match, and Rusev's in at 15, and the ring starts emptying of all driftwood and Bryan. 
Watch this, Lise. You can actually pinpoint the second the audience's heart rips in half. But instead of brushing up on their George Washington script like Ralph did, the crowd dumps all over the match like a portaloo they don't have to keep clean. People from Publishers Clearinghouse could come out next with a $1 million prize for one audience member, and the winner would probably attack them with the giant check. Goldust is next. Shattered dreams indeed. We get Kofi and then Adam Rose and then at 19, Dernan, Dernan, Dernan. Dun, 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 dun. It's Roman Reigns, and he couldn't be more hated if he personally took credit for writing the Emoji Movie. Genuinely, there's no saving this match. You know what? Let's just um, let's just fast forward to the end here. Big E, Mizdow, Heh, Swagger, Ryback, Shirtless Mayor, Mox, Titan. Oh no, he's gone. Barrett. Claudio, Big Show, Dolph, and I think that's 30? God, they're still booing. As the match pairs down, we come to an absolute masterstroke of spite. The long stale Big Show and Kane begin condescendingly dumping out unconscious crowd favourites like Dolph, Wyatt, and Ambrose, just to really maximise the intense hatred radiating from the audience. Apparently, WWE believed this would make the audience go, well, help us, Romy One, you're our only hope. Instead, the collective thought was, well, I hope Mike Chioda runs out and throws everybody out. Now, maybe if Roman initiated some cool action movie ass kicking sequence here to get both giants out, he might have got some reluctant respect from an audience already very committed to hating him. But instead, Kane and Big Show have mild dissension, and Roman simultaneously dumps them over at half the speed of meander. Roman wins. Lol. No refunds. Offended, Big Show and Kane try to attack Roman, prompting a totally normal and obviously expected run-in from The Rock, who was presumably in town checking out housing renovations to save the day. Instead of looking cool by osmosis next to The Rock, Roman looked like an attendee of an Attitude Era fantasy camp, hot knobbing with some bygone big names. Hang on. Everybody suddenly cheering. They've come to their senses and love Roman. No, wait. Oh, they're, they're cheering Rusev. He wasn't actually eliminated. Then the cheers turned to booze when Roman threw him out. The rumble concluded with the timeless visual of bloodstashed Roman having his hand raised while The Rock looked 50 shades of befuddled at his side. Meltzer gave the rumble match one and three quarter stars, writing, from a creative booking standpoint, this was easily the worst rumble ever. But how bad was it really? One, it was so bad that The Rock got booed. Two, it was so bad that outside the arena, angry fans actually harassed the wrestlers as they were leaving, refusing to let some of the vehicles pass, which isn't cool. And one moron even struck the Usos' car with a chair, prompting one of the Usos to exit the vehicle, which obviously sent the dumbass running. Three, it was so bad that even Mother Nature was offended as she blanketed Hartford, Connecticut, the site of the next night's Raw, with several feet of snow, prompting the TV taping to be cancelled. Now that is way more impressive than hitting somebody's car with a folding chair. 4. It was so bad that Mick Foley wrote an essay on how WWE was squandering the Rumble's prestige and the goodwill of the audience. Mick Foley, a force for good, the perpetual optimist, was moved to write a critical treatise of the pay-per-view where WWE tried to anoint its new top babyface. 5. It was so bad that cancelled WWE Network was top trending on Twitter. Days later, WWE announced that new subscribers would watch the network for free throughout February. None of this happened because of the middling undercard or the excellent WWE title match. This all happened because WWE went in the opposite direction of fan taste in the main event. And on top of that, the match in question sucked big time. Of course, WWE ultimately caved to the anti reign sentiment, putting over the briefcase toting Rollins in the main event of a strong WrestleMania 31. But until Plan B was enacted, there was a lot of hostility in the air. Poor Reigns couldn't win the crowd over in the interim two months, and it's unlikely he even stood a chance. Today, Reigns is much better regarded, as the Tribal Chief version of him is one of WWE's better received characters and performers, frequent absences aside. It took a long time to get Reigns to where he was more widely accepted as a top guy, because the stubborn booking before then did the man no favours at all. WWE has proven they will bend over backwards, contorting to absurd degrees to get their guy over. And there is perhaps no more glaring example of faith and confidence gone berserk than the 2015 Royal Rumble.